Hi, good afternoon, everybody. As um, Sophie said, my name is Daphne King. I am the director of Allison Fine Arts. Our gallery is located in Hong Kong, and hence my talk today is going to focus on Hong Kong modern masters. Um, the artist that I'm going to speak about is Lu Xu Quan, who is the Hong Kong ink master, and his contemporary Hong Zifan and then Wuxi Swong, Irene Cho, and Kan Tai Ke, who are all students of Lu Xu Quan. And last but not least, Rosanna Lee, who is a prominent ceramicist in Hong Kong from a slightly younger generation. Uh, so before I start the talk, I just wanted to lay the foundation of what Hong Kong, sorry, how come this thing isn't going? Oh, oh um, What Hong Kong was like uh, in the 50s, and 60s, uh, when in the 1950s, Hong Kong was just recovering from the Sino-Japanese War, and the British were re-establishing their rule over the colony. And it's obviously a far cry of what we think of Hong Kong is today. If we look at this photo, the harbor is much wider. There is not really many high rises. I think most of the buildings are like six, seven stories high only. Uh, during this time, artists were arriving in Hong Kong from China due to the civil unrest there, um, such as the artists Lu Xu Quan and Lu Xu Swang and Irene Cho and Kan Tai Ke. They mostly arrived in the late 40s, early 50s. And upon arriving in Hong Kong, these artists were exposed to Western art, uh, mostly through magazines, but later um, there were exhibitions such as this in 1962 that was organized by the British Council. It was an exhibition um, of Barbara Hepworth's work, uh, photographs, sculptures, and drawings with some original bronzes. And with this exposure, these artists who arrived began imagining some sort of new language emerging um, or synthesis of East and West art. So in 1962, the Hong Kong Museum of Art was founded. At the time, it was known as the City Hall. Uh, art at City, the museum, um, the City Hall Art Gallery and Museum. So Lu Xu Quan was invited to be the honorary advisor of this new museum, and his work was part of the inaugural exhibition. Here we have Lu Xu Quan on the right, and next to him is John Warner, who's the first curator of the museum. Han Chi Fun, uh, the other artist that I mentioned, who's his contemporary, was also part of that. His work was also part of the inaugural exhibition. Prior to the museum's opening, many of the artists didn't have places to exhibit, and they would exhibit in churches and in hotels and clubs and libraries, such as the Mandarin Hotel and the British Council Library. Um, as you can see in the pictures here, this is an exhibition um, of Lu Xu Quan's work at the British Council Library. And here is, actually I'm not sure, this was a, an exhibition actually of Western art. So if you see here, there seems to be a print of Matisse. Um, here's another news clipping from one of Lu Xu Quan's exhibitions at the Mandarin Hotel that took place in 1964. By the 1970s in Hong Kong, the art scene started to flourish a little bit more, or not flourish, but develop a little bit more. And the Hong Kong Arts Festival was founded in 1973. And here we have the poster announcing the arts festival. And the image that we see here, or the design of the whole poster, was actually done by Lu Xu Quan. And this particular painting is right now on exhibit in the U.S. and the Chicago Art Institute um, in a solo exhibition. And that same year, in 1973, Sotheby's was established. They opened their first office and held their first auction. So in the 1970s, more exhibition venues started to open, namely the Hong Kong Art Center, which was founded in 1977. Their mission was to present programs for visual arts, performing arts, moving images, and media. Other areas also covered art education and conferences and festivals. Uh, besides having this exhibition space at the art center, they also have a performing arts venue as well as a cinema in the basement. 
So then we're going to jump to the next decade in Hong Kong in the 1980s. Here's a photo of the harbor, which is vastly different from what we saw in the 50s. High-rise buildings were developing, and Hong Kong's economy was flourishing. During that time, people still talked about Hong Kong as a cultural desert. Um, but there were several galleries that started to open and organize exhibitions, and that included Alison Fine Arts. Our gallery was founded in 1981. Uh, and actually, I do want to clarify that in the, in the 70s, there were a few other galleries, but most of the ones that we know today, such as Alison Fine Arts and Gallery du Monde, they were founded in the 80s. So the gallery first started focused on promoting Hong Kong artists, as well as some overseas Chinese artists, because mainland China was not yet quite open to foreigners. And so I wanted to share I wanted to share some of our archive material from the 1980s of the artists that I'm going to be talking about. This is a uh, review of an exhibition by Han Chi Fun. It was his first exhibition with the gallery in 1983. Here we have an invitation card, uh, paintings by Lu Xu Quan. It was the first exhibition that we held for Lu Xu Quan in 1984. And here we have a photo. It's the opening of Kan Tai Pen's exhibition. This is Kan Tai Pen. Um, he's pictured here with Alice King, who is the gallery founder, and uh, Dame Lydia Dunn, who at the time was the chairman of the Hong Kong Trade Development Council. And here we have another invitation card um, from our first exhibition that we organized for Irene Cho in 1987. And this the image of this card, this painting here, is called Salute to Henry Moore. Uh, the British Council had just organized an exhibition for Henry Moore in Hong Kong the year before, so uh, obviously it had a, left a great, you know, strong impression on the artist to, for her to paint something like this. And next we have another invitation card from the Poetic Vision Poetry Paintings and Cliffy with Wu Shi Swang and Pat Khoi. This was held in 1987. Um, it was a collaborative piece between Wu Shi Swang and Pat Khoi. And actually, we have another piece here in the gallery that was from that actual exhibition. And it, the colorful bands there is by Pat Khoi, and the uh, calligraphy is done by Wu Shi Swang. So, with that, I want to delve further into each of the artists who we're going to be showcasing in our exhibition this time. And all of these artists uh, were selected because they played a very important role in the development of the art scene in Hong Kong, and in fact, still continue to play an important role. So I'm going to start with Lu Xu Quan, who is the ink master of Hong Kong, or the founding father of the new ink movement. He was born in 1919 and he immigrated to Hong Kong in 1948. When he first arrived, he worked at the Yamate Ferry Company and he stayed there until 1966, until he became a full-time artist. He held his first solo exhibition, however, in 1954. His interest in painting was inherited from his father, Liu Kaming, uh, from an early age. His father was a scholar and painter and owner of an antique shop. So with that, he was, Liu Xu Quan was able to actually observe um, and study classical Chinese paintings. At the same time, he was also looking at and studying Western art. Um, in particular, he was really fascinated by Turner's work, especially the atmospheric landscapes that, that Turner did. So Lu Xu Quan is probably best known for his Zen paintings. Here we have a very iconic work, uh, which is known as the dry Zen painting because he uses a dry brush. And the red dot on top is, sig signifies the lotus and is very much influenced from his um, beliefs in Taoism. And this work was created in 1965. Here is another Zen painting that was created in 1970, and as opposed to the previous one, this one is known as a wet Zen painting, and 
because his brush that he used was wet instead of dry. And so when looking at this painting, the beauty of it really lies in the various tones and the ink wash that we see here. So Liu Xiuquan was not only a talented artist, but he was also a teacher. He taught at both the Hong Kong University as well as the Chinese University, and he was also a scholar. And as I mentioned, the other artists that I'm going to be talking about were all his students. So for all of Lu Xiuquan's contributions to the art, he was awarded an MBE by the Hong Kong government in 1971. And, but sadly, he passed away prematurely at the age of 56 in 1975. So there's really so much more I could spend an entire lecture just talking about Lu Xiuquan. But I'm going to focus uh, on more on his relationship with the UK since we're here. Um, and I chose to bring this particular work at Cromwell Place. It's on show in Gallery 10, where I have more pieces. Uh, I highlighted this because this particular painting was actually on show in 1962 at the National Museum Museum in Oxford. It was Lu Xiuquan's very first solo exhibition. Uh, at the Ashmolean, and there were to be several others that followed. I, I also thought that this work was particularly interesting because he's using Chinese painting, but he's blending it with Western perspective, which is kind of what Lu Xiuquan has been trying to do. He's, he wants to remain rooted in his Chinese tradition, but also kind of move forward um, into kind of how to contemporize Chinese paintings. So if you look at a Chinese painting, you would rarely see perspective, where the boat in the front is larger, and then it gets smaller and smaller. In a Chinese painting, you're really reading the painting from top to bottom, or bottom to left, bottom to top, or left to right, depending on what format it is. Uh, but it's not really about the perspective. So here is an installation shot of the boat painting at the Ashmolean in 1962. I don't know if you can see it, it's right here. And I guess this was before the Ashmolean was renovated, so I'm not sure where it is now. <laughs> and here we have, uh, following that exhibition, there were many other exhibitions, and this particular exhibition, that same painting, the boat painting, was also part of. It appeared uh, in 1964 in a group show at the New Metropole Arts Center in Kent. And what was interesting was that it was part of a group show together with Henry Moore and also some arts of ancient Peru from the Victorian Albert Museum. And again, in 1965, Lu Xiuquan's paintings were shown at the New Metropole Arts Center, and here are some news clippings about it and a small brochure that was written about Yu Xiuquan. Then in 1968, his work was exhibited at the Victorian Albert Museum. But interestingly enough, even though Yu Xiuquan had all these exhibitions in the UK, he never actually visited the UK. Um, he actually never, his only trip away from Hong Kong was to Taiwan, even though he's had numerous exhibitions around the world during his lifetime. But in particular, in the UK between the 1960s and 70s, he had more than 70 exhibitions here. And so, you know, why, why did he have all these exhibitions and he was never here? So this was actually thanks to his friendship with Jeffrey Barker. Jeffrey Barker was an English military officer who he met in Hong Kong in 1958. And Barker took lessons from Lu Xiuquan and he became a lifelong admirer and supporter of Lu Xiuquan. So he left Hong Kong in 1961, and at the time he brought 84 of Lu Xiuquan's paintings with him back to the UK. And what's also very interesting is that Barker actually never took any commission from Lu Xiuquan for all the efforts and work that he did for him in helping him organize these exhibitions. Um, he was really doing it merely because he admired the artist and a, you know, he had a great passion for Lu Xiuquan's paintings. And the artist and the patron, they continued to correspond with each other until Lu Xiuquan's passing in 1975. And 
here, much I think much of um, Liu Xuquan's or Jeffrey Barker's collection is now housed at the Ashmolean in, in Oxford. And this is an image of an exhibition that was held in 2018 at the Ashmolean that commemorated uh, Liu Xuquan's centenary. In addition to the Ashmolean, Liu Xuquan's paintings are also found at the Victorian Albert Museum's collection in the UK, uh, as well as numerous other museums around the world. These include the, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the De Young Museum in San Francisco, and the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, the LA County Museum in Los Angeles, the Taipei Museum, uh, History Museum in Taiwan, and obviously the Hong Kong Museum of Art, as well as the new M Plus Museum that just opened recently. Uh, here, I wanted to just highlight, this was an three, actually three of Lu Xu Quan's paintings were on display in, um, actually four. Four of Lu Xu Quan's paintings were on display at M Plus during the inaugural ex exhibitions when the museum opened in November. And I just think that goes to show how, how you know, important this artist was to, to Hong Kong and also to the development of ink art. So here are two of the paintings and they're also really quite different in terms of style. This one here on the left is the Hong Kong at night. It's a night scene of Hong Kong. And this is another wet Zen painting. Actually, it's, you can't really tell from this picture, but it's a huge, huge piece, um, close to, well, it's three meters tall and close to two, two meters wide. And this is what his very iconic Zen painting is. This is also on show at the, um, or was on show at the same exhibition. And in another gallery, there was another large Zen painting uh, on show, and this was another show that was more not focused on Hong Kong art, but just talking about Hong Kong, uh, talking about artists and their development in the 60s and 70s. This was called Individuals, Networks, and Expressions, and it's still on display at the Hong Kong Museum of Art. I, I mean, at M Plus currently. Um, to further reiterate the point of how important Liu Xu Quan was, there was an exhibition at the LA County Museum in 1921. It was a very important uh, exhibition on ink paintings. It was called Ink Dreams. And again, Liu Xu Quan's paintings, he had two paintings on display, one of his Zen, his iconic Zen paintings, and here was another one of his landscape paintings. And of all the artists there, I think there were only one or two artists that actually had more than one painting being represented in this ink exhibition. Uh, currently, as I mentioned, the Xu Quan has an exhibition, a solo exhibition at the Art Institute of Chicago. It goes on for two more weeks. I don't know if anyone's traveling to the US or Chicago, then you should definitely go have a look. This was one of the first uh, solo shows that Xu Quan had, has had in the US for, I think, over 20, 30 years. So it's a very important exhibition. And in fact, there's a catalog right there um, that was published in conjunction with this exhibition that's very, very informative. So with that, I'm going to go, I'm gonna start talking about the second artist, Han Chi Fun. So Han Chi Fun was a self-taught artist who began painting at a young age. He was born in 1922, so he was a contemporary of Lu Xu Quan. But unlike the other artists that are in this group, he was born in Hong Kong and not in China. So as a result, I think he didn't carry that same baggage that the other artists did where they were trying to blend the traditional Chinese art with the Western art. Um, instead, his paintings are much more Western looking. So in the 1960s, um, he befriended Lu Xu Quan. And like Lu Xu Quan, uh, he actually had to work to make ends meet because a lot of these artists from this generation could not afford to be full-time artists. Lu Xu Quan was actually working at the Yamate Ferry uh, Company, and Han Chi Fan had to work at the general post office to, to make his ends meet. In 1964, he co-founded the Circle Art Group with 11 other painters and sculptors, and at this time, this group was considered very avant-garde. They grappled with 
new Western ideas, what they, uh, you know, with what they were faced with, and how they could try to remain true to their Chinese heritage. And Wisha Swan, who I mentioned and will speak about next, uh, was also part of this circle art group. Besides getting together and holding exhibitions, the beauty of this group was that it also enabled them to travel overseas. And they participated in exhibitions in 1961 at the Sao Paulo Biennial. And they were also uh, exhibiting their works at the first international exhibition of fine arts in Saigon in 62. Han Si Fun was also very lucky and he had the opportunity to travel around the world and he visited the Venice Biennale uh, in Italy as well as going to document in Germany in 1968. And the following year in 1969, he received a grant from John D. Rockefeller, uh, the John D. Rockefeller Fellowship Fund, which is currently known as the Asian Cultural Council. He uh, this enabled him to travel to the US and further his studies and explorations of Western art. He was the first recipient uh, to receive this important grant. So, I mean, uh, Han Chi Fan is best known actually for these circle paintings that he does, and they're done with spray paints um, on canvas. And this particular work, uh, Bath of Fire, was exhibited in a traveling exhibition in the UK in 1971. It was titled Art Now Hong Kong. And it traveled to London, Edinburgh, Manchester, and Bristol. And in fact, most of the artists that I'm speaking about today were all part of that exhibition, uh, except for Rosanna, who was younger and still studying at that time. So during his trip here to the UK during this exhibition, Han came and he visited Henry Moore. He then went to Paris and he, had, uh, he met with Saul Ki. And after that, between 73 and 76, he went on to the US again, and he attended lectures by Motherwell. Um, and obviously, I think if we look at these paintings, he was greatly influenced by all this Western art that he could see. So although he's better known for his circle paintings that I was showing just now, uh, I've actually decided to showcase his very early work that was done in the 50s and 60s before he did this extensive world tour. Um, and actually this series of paintings, such as the one that is shown here, was the focus of a solo exhibition called Han Chi Fun, Early Landscapes on Board at the, muse uh, the Museum at the University of Hong Kong in 2013. And here we have a painting that I'm showcasing in Gallery 10. It's called Sha Tin. Uh, this is the new territories for those who know Hong Kong well. It's considered a rural part of Hong Kong until this day. And although these huts are probably replaced with slightly, maybe not high rises, but a bit more modern um, kind of village homes, uh, this yeah, so the site is probably not quite the same as it is now. Uh, in this painting, you can see that he's utilizing Western landscape techniques and also using Western media. It's oil on board. And this particular work was done in Macau. And again, um, he's looking at Western perspective. Um, so not really relying on any Chinese tradition. Well, you know, this perspective is something we take for granted and we're really used to looking at. This is not, this was not the case for most of the Chinese people at the time when they saw this work. Also, these paintings are quite small, I wanted to, to mention. This one's 40 by 30 centimeters. And the reason because was that he actually did these on site. So he would carry these little canvases with him and drive to a place, look for a site that he found interesting, <coughs> and paint them. Um, <coughs> this work was done in 1965 in Tingao. Uh, it's of a small, sleepy fishing village at the time. And this beach is still there. But instead of these sailboats, these lovely sailboats that we see, a suspension bridge 
has been built. <laughs> and this is what we see now <laughs> at that exact same site. So since the 1970s, Han has received numerous commissions, including a mural for the Hong Kong Exhibition and Convention Center, and in 1988, a large-scale commission for Jardine House in Hong Kong, which is what is pictured here. This is the lobby of Jardine House. For the MTR, this is uh, in Kun Tong, an MTR station. And in 1990, oh, well, yeah. And then more recently, or before he passed away, there were numerous retrospective exhibitions that were held in Hong Kong of his work. In 1999, there was one at the University of Hong Kong. And then in 2005, at the Hong Kong Museum of Art. And at 207 at the City University of Hong Kong. And most recently, Asia Society held an ex solo exhibition for him in 2019. And it was quite sad because as they were preparing for that exhibition, Han sadly passed away, I think months, like a month before the actual opening and the completion of his catalog. Um, so his works are found in numerous collections in Hong Kong. This particular work was located in the lobby of the Hong Kong Museum of Arts, um, the reception area. So when you come up, it's quite a large piece. It was there for many, many years, as far as I can remember. But the Hong Kong Museum of Art recently got renovated, and it's now taken down. Um, this one is in the permanent collection of M+, and it's also on show in that same exhibition that Lu Xu Quan was in. Uh, this particular work is part of the collection of the Hong Kong Museum of Arts, slightly different from the others because there's some calligraphy here. Uh, and it's currently on show in an exhibition that focuses on Chinese characters. And lastly, this work is also part of a, um, the collection of the Hong Kong Museum of Art. It was done in 1961, so similar to the paintings that I'm showing in the gallery. Next uh, is Wuxia Suang. Wuxia Suang was born in 1936 in Guangdong, China, and he moved to Hong Kong in 1948. In 1955, he became a student of Lu Xu Quan's, who helped him understand the importance of studying Chinese traditional paintings. Uh, Wuxia Suang founded the Modern Literature and Art Association in 1958, and the members included Lu Xu Quan and Han Shi Fan. And this association mostly promoted the Hong Kong literary and art movements. And Wong also received the same grant as Han Shi Fan and the John D. Rockefeller Foundation uh, grant in 1971. And so he was able to go to the US uh, to study and to, uh, to study art. And following that, he also received a scholarship from the British Council to come here to the UK. So he studied and received both his BFA and MFA um, in the US. So combined with that time that he was there and he moved to the US again in 1985 and 90 to 96, he stayed there um, during the time when many Hong Kong, many people in Hong Kong were uncertain about the handover and left Hong Kong. So he was part of that group that uh, temporarily immigrated to the US. So his experience there allowed him to gain firsthand knowledge of the West, unlike many of his contemporaries who only had the opportunity to study Western art through books. So his, his paintings is really about how to reassert the traditional Chinese style but also incorporate Western design elements together into his painting. So he was particularly fascinated by the Bauhaus movement. And this is one of the paintings from one of the Bauhaus artists by Mondrian. So he admired their structure and their logic and especially the grids that are present in this painting. And he, but at the same time, he was also fascinated um, by Chinese traditional painting, and mostly from the Northern Song, these large landscape, monumental landscape paintings, 
and in particular Fan Juan. This particular work travels among mountains and streams, a very famous painting. Um, he was really fascinated with this piece. And so the result is seen here. You can see the grids. They're slightly turned on a diagonal in this painting. But in the background, you have the mountain, the mountain scenes uh, and the grids superimposed on top of them. So this is something that he has been exploring continuously in various forms. Some are more simple, some are more, have more grids. Um, this is another piece that he did. This one maybe showcases the mountains a little bit more. But he basically never really deviated from this explore, exploration of landscape painting and how to contemporize it, how to combine the East with the West. So for all his efforts, he received numerous awards, including a bronze Bohemia Star Medal from the Hong Kong SAR government. He also received a, uh, received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Hong Kong Arts Development Council. And most recently, he received an honorary Artist of the Year Award from Asia Society in Hong Kong. Um, two major retrospectives for Wong have been held at the Hong Kong Museum of Art in 2006 and at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University in 2016. And pictured here is a review of his retrospective exhibition at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. His paintings were also included in a very important exhibition in the US titled China 5,000 Years. This was held at the Guggenheim Museum in New York in 1998. Um, and at the time was, I think, groundbreaking because Westerners had not really seen what was going on uh, in mainland China. Most of the paintings in that exhibition were from mainland China, but uh, which just was included in this exhibition as well as somebody from Hong Kong. Um, in the UK, his works have been collected by the British Museum and the Ashmolean Museum, and I believe that this painting here is in the collection of the Ashmolean. In the US, his works have been collected by the Art Institute of Chicago, the, um, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and in Hong Kong at the Heritage Museum and the University Museum, um, as well as the Hong Kong Museum of Art, and of course at M+. And this is the piece that's on display at M+. Uh, this is a piece that is currently on display, the one right here, is currently on display at an exhibition at the Hong Kong Museum of Art, and it's similar to the work that we have here in the gallery, where it's a collaborative work between Pat Hui and Wuxi Swang. So Wuxi Swang, again, has done all this calligraphy, and Pat Hui has done the, um, the bold strokes and lines. Um, and very briefly, I just wanted to mention that Pat Hui, I didn't really talk about him, or I won't, I won't really be talking about her. She was also a student of Lu Xu Quan's. Uh, and interesting fact about her was that she helped do a lot of the translations of the letters that Jeffrey Barker and Lu Xu Quan, uh, when they were communicating, because Lu Xu Quan actually did not know Chinese, and Jeffrey Barker initially did not know um, I mean, Lu Xu Quan didn't know English, and Jeffrey Barker at the time did not know any Chinese at the beginning. He later did actually study Chinese um, because he was so fascinated with the culture and maybe because he really wanted to be able to communicate with Lu Xu Quan without a translator. But anyway, so Pat Ho was the one who, one of several of his students who helped uh, do the translation of these letters. And actually right here, this piece is an, a painting by Han Chi Fan. Um, and it's also currently on display at the Hong Kong Museum of Art. Uh, so the next artist that I'm going to speak about is Irene Cho. Uh, Irene was born in Shanghai in 1924, and then she moved to Hong Kong in 1949. She started learning painting in 1950 when she was in Hong Kong from uh, this from a famous artist, Zhao. Ziu Xiaolong, who was part of the Lingnan school, uh, who painted in a much more traditional style. And this is one of her paintings that she did when she was together with uh, this, this artist. He, she was, he was one of his, uh, her longest kind of mentors. Later, she 
met Lu Xuquan and she started learning painting from Lu Xuquan and she claims that it was him who really changed the way she painted and the way that she looked at paintings. So vastly different. Um, through, as, she, as I mentioned, through Lu Xuquan, she discovered what to her what painting meant and she realized that painting wasn't just copying classical masters, but it was really a way to express one's feelings. Uh, and she was very much fascinated with the way brush and ink was used in Chinese paintings. Uh, she started to incorporate circles, um, which to her represented uh, the universe, stars, and the planets, basically outer space. And here, this motif of trees and roots are something that she uses repeatedly as well. Uh, this is one of the paintings that I have on display in Gallery 10. And as I mentioned, you know, the circles, that's something very iconic of hers, as well as these roots reappear in this painting. Here is another piece that she did uh, and is on display in the gallery. Uh, again, with the circles, she has some calligraphy combined. Um, and this particular piece, red, is something that she started working a lot with in her later years. She had a stroke in the 1990s. This piece was done in 2002. Um, and it's much happier and more cheerful than the two black paintings that I showed you previously. Uh, the reason why she started using red, she said, because she, uh, her body's constitution lacked fire, and to her, him, her fire, um, red represented fire, and she also likes the warmth that this created. Uh, Genesis, this is one of the first paintings where she's, uh, that was done in the 1980s, where she first started exploring these circles. So as early as 1970, her work was on show in the UK. This particular, um, this particular photo is of the traveling exhibition that I mentioned, Art Now Hong Kong. Um, here you can see some of Lu Xu Quan's paintings. And this one here is Irene's painting. Again, focusing on these roots and the tree. Um, in fact, this one is titled Tree Number Eight. Uh, this work, uh, this, her works are also found in important institutions around the world, including at the British Museum and at the Ashmolean. Um, An Asia Society held a retrospective of her work in 2019. And pictured here, uh, again, whoops, okay, here, this is her painting. Um, together with Lu Xu Quan's painting, and this is Lu Xu Swan's painting. Uh, this was part of an exhibition at the M Plus uh, at the Pavilion before the actual large M Plus museum was opened. It was uh, an exhibition on ink paintings called The Weight of Lightness, Ink Art at M Plus. Uh, and it was held in 19, uh, sorry, 2017 to 2018. And this is a work that is currently on display at M Plus uh, as part of their exhibition. And here again, the color red appears in a circular form. It's almost like a ball of fire with an explosion. Uh, next, the artist I want to talk about is Kan Tai Ke. Kan Tai Ke was born in 1942 in Guangdong. So he's uh, slightly younger from the other three artists that I spoke about, he's still alive. Um, the other artists have all passed away. And Khan had actually studied both with Lu Xu Quan and with Wu Xi Suang. Um, with Lu Xu Quan, he learned painting, and from Wu Xi Suang, he learned design, graphic design. So Khan Tai Ke moved to Hong Kong in 1957, and like the other artists, he also had to work in a different field to make a living. Uh, so when he first arrived there, he was a tailor. Um, and he worked as a tailor for 10 years. And in 1967, he became a full-time graphic designer. So something that is related to the arts, but um, not completely painting. But 
for his efforts as a graphic designer. In 1979, he was awarded one of uh, the 10 Outstanding Young People Award in Hong Kong. And the picture here is him and his wife celebrating that, um, that award ceremony. And here is a picture of Han Tai Kung in 1967 uh, sketching outdoors. So Khan was an active member of the One Art Group in the 1970s. This was an organization that consisted mostly of Lu Xu Quan students, and they were proponents of the new ink art movement, which was how to revolutionize ink painting, how to make this traditional Chinese form relevant, continue to be relevant um, in today's society. So Khan Tai Khan's paintings are based on calligraphy, as we see here. Um, and then he's got this red dot, I think, kind of to pay homage to his, his uh, master, Lu Xu Quan. And here, as I mentioned, he was also a student of Wu Shi Suang. And so I think here you can very much see Wu Shi Suang's influence with the grids. And then here are the mountain scenes, similar to what Wu Shi Suang was doing. But I think because he was a, a graphic designer, his paintings appear much more um, of graphic nature. And this particular painting is in the collection of M+. Uh, here is another painting that is part of M+, collection. It's an earlier work from 1977. Um, but also, I think you can see <coughs> Wuxi Swang's influence in the mountains and somewhat of a grid pattern. It's currently on show in, um, in the exhibition as part of the Hong Kong collection. Um, and as I mentioned, Kan Tai Kung was a graphic designer. He, des he designed many well-known logos here. You can see including the Bank of China logo. And here is a set of stamps that he, he did. These are catalogs um, for a group show, the One Art Group Show that he was part of, um, some catalogs and posters that he's done. And so for his efforts, um, he received a bronze bohemia from the Hong Kong government in 1990. And these, many of these posters and designs are also currently in the exhibition of M Plus as part of their, in their design gallery. So in recent years, uh, Kan Tai Kung started to develop his unique, a unique voice um, here these painting, this painting, which is also on display right now in Gallery 10, is based on Chinese characters. Um, if you look at this, you can't really quite decipher what it is, but these are lines. Actually, what I believe this one is a part of a character, of the character Wind, Feng. Um, and then he's added some water, uh, waterfalls, and then these little, little lines and dots are represented, uh, represent paint, uh, trees. Here is another one that is on display in Gallery 10. It's also based on characters, but here you really can't see the characters and they're just kind of like strokes. It could be the end of one of the words. Um, and here could be a side of one of the, the brush strokes. Um, but here you have, he's added a, a tree, which he told me actually represents himself. Uh, and not this little man, which I thought was originally, but the tree um, who's supposed to represent like longevity and uh, sturdiness is, is him. And this is another piece that is also on display, much more abstract, but has the same idea with the calligraphy. And I find it's really quite amazing how he just uses a few small dots and he's able to create that waterfall and trees that you can see here. Um, his work is widely collected by museums and private collectors alike. Uh, in the UK, they're in the collection again at the Ashmolean Museum um, and also at the Victoria and Albert Museum here in London. And currently, um, they're part of an exhibition at the Hong Kong Museum of Art, and this particular painting uh, is actually a digital, um, a digital work. Uh, I saw it in the museum recently. It's still on display, and the 
you're actually you actually stand there and the, the images and the lines and the waterfalls move. Um, so it's quite a fascinating set of um, a video, basically a video art that he that he's done. And it's part of that the same exhibition, the creative Chinese characters that um, Wuxis is painting, the collaborative work, and Han Xiuquan's painting are part of now in Hong Kong. Um, the last artist that I want to speak about is Rosanna Lee. Rosanna was born in 1957, so a younger artist from the others uh, in the group. And unlike the other artists who were born in China and immigrated to Hong Kong, she was of a generation. She was born in Hong Kong. Um, but, and she was a, she's a well-known ceramicist in Hong Kong. Her works can be seen uh, in all over the city. But to call Lee a ceramicist is oversimplifying it. She's really a conceptual artist who uses ceramics as her medium to convey her message. So Lee studied ceramics at the Hong Kong Polytechnic. And like many of the students in Hong Kong, uh, during that time in the 1980s, she decided to come here to the UK to pursue her education. So she studied at the University of Liverpool, and then she, uh, she further studied and earned a Diploma of Art Education at the University of London. And then she got a master's degree in educational management from the Gloucester College in Cheltenham before she returned to Hong Kong after spending a whole decade here in the UK. So her ceramic figures often depict plump ladies, or men, um, engaged in everyday mundane activities. And here we can see this figure uh, relaxing, having a beer, and enjoying herself. So when you look at this, you probably kind of chuckle and smile. Um, and as I mentioned, to just call her a ceramicist is oversimplifying it, because what she's really trying to tell all of us is that we need to slow down, um, in particular in Hong Kong, probably here in the UK as well, um, or any major city. We're always too busy. We're running around looking at this and looking at that and never really enjoying ourselves. So she's trying to tell us to slow down and enjoy life. And here again, she's depicting a very common, mundane, um, everyday, uh, subjects where the lady's drinking either maybe tea or soup or maybe a shot glass but slightly too big. <laughs> but anyway, I, she's basically telling us to you know slow down, enjoy your life, don't rush through life all the time. Um, and furthermore, her use of these chubby figures is also commenting on societal view about you know women's images. Um, why is everything always why do people consider slim is beautiful? Um, and to her, this is beautiful. Uh, and actually, it's quite interesting because she herself is actually a very tiny and slim girl, I think you could see from the, uh, the photo that I showed you. Um, so, Rosanna has participated in numerous solo and group exhibitions around the world, including here in the UK, um, in China, as well as in the US and Canada and France, uh, around Asia and Singapore, Malaysia and Thailand. And as I mentioned before, her works are found in many public spaces in Hong Kong. Uh, in particular, this work, I see it every time I leave the airport, even though I haven't been flying that much during COVID. It was actually installed during COVID. Uh, this is at the Hong Kong International Airport at the departure gates. So the next time you are in Hong Kong and leaving, uh, Slow down and look around, and you'll see Rosanna's, Rosanna's sculpture there. They're larger than life pieces. You almost can't miss them if you do really slow down. Um, here is another. Oops. Oh, here. Here is another work by her, um, which also, funny enough, is outside of the MTR station, the, the tube station, um, and most of the time we're rushing to catch the, you know, catch that tube. Uh, and not really enjoying herself. So here she's got these large plump figures, five of them, uh, six of them, sitting around enjoying their life. One's talking on the phone, one's fanning themselves looking up in the sky, and you know, other ones having a donut. 
Uh, so it's quite humorous when you see the people running, running uh, quickly past it. So this is another installation, a large scale installation of hers in Wan Chai. There's a street there that is called the Wedding Card Street. I think it's actually probably torn down now, but originally it was there and people would go there to make their invitations for weddings. And so she was commissioned to do the sculpture of a couple on their wedding day, um, celebrating. And so on that note, I wanted to end this talk, um, you know, on a happy and prosperous note. <laughs> And um, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask me, I'm happy to try to answer them. And thank you. Thank you for coming. And please do come by um, our space in Gallery 10. We have a selection of those paintings that I just showed and talked about. Is that, do you have any questions? Yeah, I know that you grew up with your um, mother having started the gallery. Do you remember which of these artists in particular had an impact on you earliest in your life? Oh, um, yeah. So I didn't mention, but my mother, Alice King, was the founder of the gallery. And so, like um, Sophia said, I've grown up with these artworks, uh, many of them in our house, actually, as well as going to the gallery when I was young and meeting some of these artists. So I think the one who probably had the largest impact on me was Lu Xu Quan because we had a very large Lu Xu Quan painting hanging um, just outside of my room actually above the staircase. And so I would pass by and see it every day. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> I think he was, he was probably the one who influenced me or had, a, had the greatest impact on my life. Yeah. Um, is it, can you say that there's a time, say 70s or 80s or 90s, when these Hong Kong artists really were the center of contemporary Chinese art. Um, yeah, I think you could say that because if we look at what's going on in China in the 70s, it was really closed and people didn't know what was going on. And the, their types of paintings, a lot of them, well, they either had to do those communist big poster paintings or they were hiding um, to do something more traditional. So I think what people really knew or were exposed to was what was going on in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So that, it, yeah, partly it would be correct to say that. But then a lot of those artists drew on their mainland Chinese heritage. Yes, yeah, so um, I think actually it's quite interesting because the three of Lu Xu Quan, Wu Xu Suang, and Pan Tai Kang, um, they, and Irene Cho, they were all from China, and so they, they drew on that cultural heritage, whereas Rosanna and Han Chi Fan were born in Hong Kong. So, you know, as I mentioned in the talk, I think for them, they didn't have that extra baggage. They didn't necessarily have a, um, they didn't necessarily study like classical Chinese painting. And so they didn't have that strong foundation that they kept grappling with. How do we combine the East and the West from, you know, especially in Hong Kong, that's what we're exposed to, the East and the West. So they didn't, they didn't have that as much, I think. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, you know, compared to Taiwanese artists, how would you differentiate like this era of Chinese, you know, compared to their contemporaries in Taiwan at the same time? So, hmm, I guess the contemporaries in Taiwan would be somebody like you're thinking of like Liu Guosong or Zhang Jie, who people part of the new, what, what do you call it, the, the Fit Moon group. Um, I think for them, they also left China, a lot of those, right? So they left China also in the 50s and went to Taiwan. I think that their, their development is slightly different because they didn't have that east-west exposure, whereas in Hong Kong, because it was a British colony and the British Council was bringing in these you know, amazing uh, exhibitions of Western art like Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth, um, that they were exposed to this. And so for them, how to contemporize Chinese painting was this blending through the East and West. Whereas in Taiwan, because they weren't exposed to that, Taiwan was more of a, a, you know, a sleepy island, and they didn't have that. Maybe they had some Japanese culture that was, was there, but it was still very much Asian influence. So I think in that sense, they're, they're, it's quite different. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, the artists that certainly 
huge requirement, I suppose, for the sort of Western artists that they're most frequently compared to the abstract expressionist American painters. Were there any exhibitions of American, any American painters in Hong Kong? Um, that's a good question. I, I think there must have been. I have to confess, I didn't do the research on that because I was here in the UK. I was trying to focus on UK artists, but also because it was a British colony and a lot of these exhibitions were organized by the British Council. So I think they focused more on British artists. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure there must have been some American artists who, you know, who exhibited in Hong Kong as well, but probably less frequently. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. And like I said, please do come to the other gallery and have a look at the, the paintings that we have on display there. And if you have more questions there, we can speak, um, you know, in private. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>